Okay, so how is everyone today? Pretty good. Good. So last time, uh, <clears throat> last time we had just begun talking about uh, exponentials. And we, we went through the thought experiment of, of the rent situation where, where we said, okay, suppose that, um, suppose that I want to rent an apartment from you and I'll agree to, and I want to rent it with w weekly payments for 52 weeks and I'll agree to paying a million dollars a week or alternatively I'll agree to giving you one penny in the first week, two in the second week, I'll double that to four and then double it uh, uh, four in the, th in the third week, I'll double it to eight in the next week, I'll double it to 16 pennies now. Uh, and then the somewhat surprising result, in c if you weren't already familiar with, um, with, with, that, with that story, is that uh, on, the, on, the, on the last week, what is the, the payment? <laughs> yeah, 22 and a half trillion dollars. And if you were to add up, um, if you were to add up all the payments that came before that one, they would all add together to be about twenty-two and a half trillion dollars. So altogether, uh, that would be uh, on the order of forty-five trillion dollars, which is more than fifty-two million. Okay, so w which is what you would get for a million a week. So the the point of that, um, the point of that thought experiment, which is very very old, right? In fact, in fact, the way. <laughs> The, the apocryphal, m most apocryphal version of it that I know is that, you know, back in the days of kings and peasants and things like that, a peasant somehow saved the king or the kingdom or something it's significant. And then <clears throat> the king said, you can have whatever you want. And the peasant said, okay, I just want something very simple. And he went over the, to the king's chessboard and said, I just want, I want one grain of rice on this one, and then two on the next one, and then double it on the next one. But how many, how many squares are there on a chessboard? 60, 64, because it's eight by eight. So that's even more than 52, right? <laughs> and so, you know, the clever peasant, uh, you know. If that story has any, any truth to it, the king just probably killed him. <laughs> <laughs> for being insolent, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but the point, the point is that e exponential growth is quite fast. Okay. So, uh, let's, let's get a look at this. So, for example, let's consider uh, the function g of x is... 2 to x. So in the first place, I want to make a table of values. Table has an L first. So we'll go from negative 3 to positive 3. So negative 3 negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll start out with the easiest possible one. So what's, uh, what is the output when the input is 0? What is 2 to exponent 0? 1, right? And then uh, once you have one position, the rest of them are easy because to move side to side, all you have to do is multiply by two uh, when you move to the right. So because this is one, what's the next one? Two. Because after all, two to one is two. And then to move to the right, you get four and then eight. 
because after all, 2 to exponent uh, 3 is 8. Okay, so if moving to the right, uh, you multiply by 2, what do you do to move to the left? Which one? Divide by 2, right? Uh, so <coughs> this would be uh, half. And then what's next? A fourth. And then an eighth. Now, <coughs> if you were to continue going to the left, the numbers would get smaller and smaller and smaller, but they'd all be positive. Okay, so eventually you'd get like one over very big number. Uh, but but that's po uh, small but positive. And going this way, the numbers increase without bound. Okay, and to remind you, to remind you about that negative three business, if you wanted to calculate negative two to negative three directly, uh, as a reminder, how could you write this expression with a positive exponent? Very good. One over two to exponent three, which is of course one over eight. Any question about calculation? Okay. So now let's plot this. Okay, so for input 0, we get output 1. Go right there. And then every time we move to the right, we double the height. So 2, 4, and then 8 is like right there. Okay, every time we move 1's one spot to the left, we half the height, so that'd be half, half of that, half of that, that's about as far as I can go with a pin. And if we were to plot lots and lots and lots of points instead of just those seven points, <coughs> you'd see something that looks like this. So it goes up very quick, right? 22 and a half trillion <laughs> in less than 100 moves, way less than 100 moves, around 50 moves. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, let's let's write let's write down it, its its in behavior. So one thing I'd like for you to observe uh, is that two to x is greater than zero. It's greater than zero for all x's. It, it, it never becomes negative, or, and it never even becomes zero either. So that's, that's interesting. How about as you go to the left, what does g of x do? That is to say, 2 to x, what does it do? goes to zero, soon height. And as you go to the right, what does g of x do? It, go, it goes up, quickly so. Much quicker than any of the other functions uh, we've talked about. <coughs> Okay. Any question about this one? Okay, this, uh, 
this kind of, of plot is referred to as exponential growth because as you move to the right, you're getting bigger. Okay, let's look at, uh, let's look at this one. How about d of x is half to exponent x? So what, what, what I did is I, I changed this number that's being raised to exponent x. Uh, I changed it from 2 to half. And again, I want to make a table of values. Again, we'll go from input negative 3 to positive 3. Again, I'll ask about input 0. So what is half to exponent 0? One. Uh, I, said, I said one, and then I wrote, I wrote 0. I'm not, I don't know. One. <clears throat> OK. So now, to move one position to the right, what do we need to do? multiply by half to move to the right because that's that's this number right when it was 2 we multiplied by 2 to move to the right because it's half we multiply by half to move to the right so this would be half and then a fourth and then an eighth is that is that is that the mic found the mute button. Okay, so then, uh, so to move to the right, you multiply by half. What do you do to move to the left? You, you div so if it's to the right, it's multiply by half. To the left, it's divide by half. But what, what, what's a more common way to say divide by half? Multiply by two. So two... Four, eight. Okay, so what? What? Uh, I hope you recognize these numbers. <laughs> uh, what? What bearing do they have on the previous example? What relationship do they have? They're the same, but they're being read in the opposite order, right? So notice that this is this. The the first one was was. Uh, 2, 4, 8, 1, 2, 4, 8, like this, but that's to the right, but then to the, now it's moving to the left. So why should it, why should it be that way? Well, just to, to, to see that pattern, I'd like for you to observe uh, that we could take half to x, take half to x, and then I'll distribute the x to numerator and denominator. So this would be 1 to x over 2 to x. But what's 1 to x? Just 1, right? So this would be 1 over 2 to x. But then I could move that to the numerator if I made that negative x. And on the previous page, we were dealing with 2 to x. So the previous page, it was 2 to x. So to, in a sense, to get to this page, we negated the x. And we talked about uh, transformations, shifts and scales and everything like that. 
what transformation is it to negate the x? Do you remember? Is it a shift, a scale? It's a reflection, right? In particular, it's a horizontal reflection, which is why these numbers are being read in the opposite order. So we're going to draw, we're going to draw this, but you should already have a very good idea of how it's going to look. It's going to look just like this one, except reflected. Okay, so again, input 0, output 1. And now moving to the right, we divide by 2. And to the left, multiply by 2. Any question about plotting those points. Okay, then drawing this. Uh, of course, it's its left and right behavior is opposite uh, <coughs> of, of the previous page. So in particular, as x goes to the left, uh, d of x is going to go to positive infinity. And as x goes to the right, d of x is going to go to 0. But one thing that they do have in common is that 2 to negative x is, again, always greater than 0. Or, if you like, half to x. Any question about this one? So <coughs> these are the two major mm, kinds of exponential functions. So we're going to now define it. Exponential function. Let uh, let b be a positive number that's not one uh, <clears throat> the function f of x is b to x. So in, in particular, b has to be a constant. The function b to exponent x is called an exponential function. And there's two major uh, varieties.
one of them is when zero is less than b is less than one. So for example, b could be half. So it would be like uh, uh, one, one example ago. This situation is called uh, exponential decay. Uh, the other case, what must be true about B in the other case? Greater than 1. By the way, uh, why are we not interested in 1? Yeah, then it wouldn't have any bendiness. It'd be, it'd be equal to 1 all the time, because 1 to x would be 1. Uh, also, uh, we're going to insist that this, this number b is uh, positive, because, for example, if b were, say, negative 1, then what could we possibly make of, say, uh, w when x is half? That would be asking for the square root of negative 1. And that's going to be a problem. So to, to avoid all of that uh, hairy issues, we'll have a positive not one constant. So this is called exponential growth. And so I can finally stop saying b. Uh, this number right here is referred to as the base, which is, of course, why letter is B. So exponential growth looks like this. Okay. So to give you some, some physical intuition uh, about this, <coughs> The, uh, the sort of standard, standard physical example for, for, for this one, for the decay case, is called radioactive decay. And the, the, standard, the standard example for this is uh, carbon-14 dating. So, from chemistry or, or, or physics, uh, there's, a, there's an atom called carbon. How many protons does carbon have? Six. <laughs> six, six protons. Uh, and then. Um, uh, th those are the positive, positively charged uh, particles that are that are in the nucleus, uh, but there are there are neutral elements in the in the in the nucleus. What are they called? Neutrons. And then uh, to 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 stabilize uh, a bunch of protons, you've got to add some neutrons in order for in order for the that nucleus to become stable uh, and be. Different atoms of carbon can have different numbers of neutrons. Uh, what are the different things called? I'm fishing for a word that starts with I. Isotope. So what's the most common isotope of, of carbon? Carbon 12. By like, on the order of like 99.9% .9 of all carbon uh, in your body is carbon 12. Carbon-13 is uh, very rare, and carbon-14 is also uh, is, is less rare. But the reason, in your body anyway, but the reason why it's less rare is because uh, our atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. Uh, how many protons does nitrogen have? Two. 
Yeah? One more. <laughs> One more than carbon. <laughs> seven. So it's got seven. So just like, just in a similar way that, that, that carbon wants usually 12, uh, sorry, wants six neutrons to stabilize its six protons, uh, nitrogen also usually wants seven neutrons to stabilize its seven protons. So the typical weight of nitrogen is 14. And our, our, uh, our atmosphere is made primarily of, of nitrogen. So w way up high in our atmosphere toward the edge of space where we're getting blasted by all of the radiation, uh, ionized particles coming out of, c coming out of the sun, uh, what happens is, is that the, they, they uh, for example, cosmic rays, they slam into uh, the, mole uh, the, the molecules that are, that are up in space, and then they, they, they let loose a free neutron. This free neutron hits the, hits the nitrogen atom very hard, hits the nitrogen nucle nucleus very hard, displaces a proton, and replaces it with, with a neutron. So this neutron displaces a proton within, within uh, nitrogen, and then what do you have? You got carbon. And it still has a weight of 14. But carbon-14 is unstable. Uh, so specifically, the graphite in this pencil uh, is, is all made out of carbon. So, so in actual fact, there's some clay in there to make it hard, but let's ignore that. Suppose it was all carbon. Uh, if we had, if this was a, if this was a one kilogram brick of carbon-14, if su su suppose that to be the case, then we could sit here patiently, go get a coffee, and watch it for 5,700 years, and very slowly, very slowly, uh, the carbon-14 nucleus, uh, the, the carbon-14 nuclei are unstable. They'll emit a, a, a beta particle, turning one of those uh, neutrons back into a proton, and the carbon turns back into nitrogen. So what will happen is that after 57 years, uh, 5,700 years, this one kilogram of carbon uh, will be half a kilogram of carbon, because the rest of it will have the balance of it would have turned into nitrogen. And then if we, w if we wait another 57 years, 5,700 years, then half of half of it would, would still be carbon-14. So we'd have a quarter of a kilogram. And if we waited another 5,700 years, then half of half of half of that uh, would be, would be uh, carbon-14. And we could sit here and watch it decay over time. So, so the amount of time that it takes for for something to, to uh, decay, half is called its half-life. So if you've ever heard of carbon-14 dating or, or if you've heard, oh, we dug up whatever in the glacier, that kind of thing, and they say, oh, it's a 40,000-year-old uh, mammoth or what, what, what have you, uh, what they're doing, what they're doing is that all of us have carbon-14 in our bodies, but when you get dead and buried, and you're, not, and you're not taking in new carbon anymore, your carbon-14 slowly decays. And so all, all that's happening is that you just take, you take this, this specimen, you know how much a living or carbon-14 a li living organism should have, and then you measure how much carbon-14 is in this dead and buried thing that you just found, and you just work backwards. You, you ask, how many half-lives must it have gone through uh, in order to get to this state? So it's, it's only actually useful out to about approximately 10 half-lives. If you get it, that, that means it's only good to about 60,000 years. You can't do carbon-14 dating past that. It just doesn't work because there's not enough carbon-14 atoms anymore uh, to, to measure. And also, this half-life behavior is not quite, it, this is a statistical phenomenon. And when you start getting less than many billions of, of atoms, it doesn't work. Uh, so what's another? very important radioactive de uh, decay dating isotope and atom. Uranium. uranium is a really important one. It, it's uranium because uranium has a, has a half-life on the order of about 100,000 years. It decays to thorium and lead. And the thing is, is that uh, f for, for that reason, 
you can take uh, rocks, and if 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 uh, you can you can measure how old these rocks are by measuring uh, if they happen to have uranium in them. If they don't, then it's, then, you, then you can't measure them. But if you find if you found a rock that's not a sedimentary rock, but rather it's a it's an igneous rock, and it's got it's got uh, uh, it's got uranium in it. You can measure its ra its ratio of of uranium to thorium to lead, the specific isotopes, and you can figure out how old it is. And that's how we know that 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 the Earth and all of the comets around us are all all about four and a half billion years old. <laughs> so, very interesting. <clears throat> what is the what is the sort of go to science example for exponential growth? Population. That's a good one. That that's probably that probably is the best one. Okay. So in particular, I'm going to. Uh, in particular, I'll, I'll consider bacteria. So imagine you've got a petri dish, which is just you know when you see science on CSI and they've got the little thingy there and the, that's what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> uh, what 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 that is? That's that's like uh, heaven for a bacterium. That's, that's what it is. It's all the food and nutrients and everything that it could that it that it could possibly ever want. So if you take a back uh, a, a single bacterium and and you and you put it in here, it's going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, uh, and then eventually, it's going to it's going to get so big that it that it signals itself that it's time to 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 cleave. And what you'll have is you'll have two daughters, two daughter. Uh, bacteria. So it it got really big, you know, really long sausage bacteria there, and psh, now you've got two of them. Okay, that's twice as many as you had before, right? <laughs> First you had one, now you have two. Now each one of these is going to grow, a and understand that that the the actual agar plate, the actual petri dish, is enormous in comparison to the bacteria. This is not even close to scale. So. So now you've got these two, and they're going to grow and thrive because this is the perfect environment for bacteria. And then each of them are going to cleave. And how many do you have now? Four. And then those are going to grow and thrive. And then, and then all, all of those are going to cleave. And then how many do you have? Eight. So after every, uh, after every, uh, after every cleavage, after every uh, growth, uh, and division of these, you double the number of bacteria. Okay, so after only about 52 of these, you've already got trillions and trillions of them. Trillions and trillions of them. Now, you, you have to kind of, j just like you have to kind of say, well, it only works so far. Th this also only works so far because because the bacteria will start growing quite quick to where you can actually see them visibly on the plate, the, a colony of them, and they're, they'll hit the wall. And they're not going to, like, jump over the wall. <laughs> That'd be scary. Uh, th that's not what happens. So, so what I mean is that, is that they, they have exponential growth uh, as long as there, there's no, nothing is limiting them. And, but, and in fact, before they hit the wall, they'll get slowed down by something else. What? No, they'll still have plenty of food, but they get slowed down by something else. Yeah, it's kind of gross. Their own poop, <laughs> their own waste products. Okay, they just there's it, it messes just like it messes up our metabolism if we don't have proper sanitation. It messes up their metabolism too. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, exponential growth. Uh, this, this is also one of the main reasons why even though, even though the world, including campus, is just teeming with, with, with macroscopic creatures like ourselves, you never really s often see dead creatures. Why is that? This is why. <laughs> this is why. It only, it, it, it's, it's very quick. In the first place, predation finds them in scavengers, but, but you, get, you get eaten up very, very quickly by bacteria because your entire body and your entire intestinal tract is just literally teeming 
with bacteria. And, for, for, and as soon as it, life is a constant struggle to keep you in, in equilibrium with all them to keep them from eating you, and as soon as your metabolic processes turn off, uh, in fact, the, there, there's more helpful bacteria inside of you than there are cells in you. Your cells. Your, your own. So like you could say, you could say, well, I've got, I've got the human cells and I've got the bacterial cells. There's more bacterial cells than human cells. Well, it's a, it's a fact. Well, you, you would die because you couldn't, you couldn't live and digest and metabolize and do anything without them. You just, you'd die. For, for not for long. <laughs> so, but, but, here's the thing, is that as, as soon as those very helpful bac bacteria determine that you're not alive anymore, then your lunch. Their lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Fair weather friends. Okay. <clears throat> and it doesn't take long for them to figure it out, actually. Uh, good. So any question of... Uh, about that. So the most common, beside, besides those f f physical processes uh, related to exponential growth and decay, uh, the main one that we'll study in this class actually is interest. And, and but what I mean by that is money. So in the first place, we have two interest models. And the first one we'll refer to as simple interest. And this is not the way it works in real life. Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll quick get to the next model, which is more or less the way it works in real life. Okay. So one of the things I, want, I would really like all of you to understand be at, before you leave, one of the main concepts I want you to have before you get out of college algebra is what is interest? Okay, and I don't mean like, okay, I get it. Like somehow I get more money or I owe more money. Like, m almost anyone knows that, but, but the question is why? Why is that the case? So it has to do with that having control of a resource at a specific time itself is worth money. So, so uh, many of you took out loans to pay for, to take this class and, and to take the rest of your classes. So, so you went to the bank and you said, bank, I see you've got like a mountain of cash right there. I'd like to have just a little bit of it so, so I can uh, go, go pay UTD. And they say, great, yeah, we'll agree to that. Uh, we'll agree to, to giving you exclusive access to these thousands of dollars right now so that we can't have them and we can't demand them from you. But in exchange for giving you access to that capital right now, you're going to have to agree, agree to, a pay, to pay us back all of that capital plus a little more because that's how inconvenient it is for us to give you that money right now, for us to give up the access, the exclusive access to that capital right now. So that's, that's why when you take out a loan, there's interest assessed. That's also the same reason why if you put money into a savings account, if you look at the contract of your savings account, you should read the fine print. Uh, it says things like, okay, you can put money in and then after it's been in there for this amount of time, then it starts accruing interest. And you can take money out, but we reserve, and, and often it will be immediate, like you can request it and we'll hand it over immediately, but we reserve the right uh, to, to deny your request for this duration of time and under these circumstances and according to these rules and just all kinds of stuff. So what that is, is that's the, bank's, that's the bank saying, okay, yeah, we'll hold your money, but we're going to use it. And in order for us to be able to use it, uh, we, need, we need contractual guarantees that we're going to be able to use it. So you can't just take it at, in and out willy-nilly because we're going to use it. Because they're going to use it to lend to other people and do other things. So you're saying what the trade-off is, if you put your money in a savings account and you're getting interest, you're saying, okay, bank, I will give you, I will give you access to this capital and, and I won't have exclusive access to, to it anymore. We're going to share. And the bank says, thank you. We're going to use that money to make money. And the interest is your cut. That's what it is. OK. So any question about what it is? 
It's about exclusive access, access to capital at a specific time. So, okay, another question. Suppose that you have two savings accounts. One of the savings account, uh, L for low, has $1,000 in it, and saving account H has a million dollars in it, for H for high. Which one do you think will have more, will, will uh, accrue more interest? H, right? H, because, well, because it's, you're giving, you're giving access to more money. So they're going to be able to do more work with it. So you're going to get a bigger cut. So interest has to be proportional to the size uh, of, of, of the exchange. So in that, that proportionality is called the rate. So in particular, if we have uh, a P is principal, so this could be either uh, the loan amount or the deposit amount. So if someone's loaning you, then the principal is negative. Uh, if, if you're depositing, then the principal is positive. Uh, that kind of idea. R, this is referred to as the interest rate. T, this is the, uh, the number of periods. And I is the interest payment. These are all related to each other with the formula. I is PRT. And again, I'm telling you that this is not the way it works in real life. So what, what this model is saying is that, OK, suppose, suppose at the beginning you make an initial deposit of size P. And you say, here you go, bank. I want you to hold my P dollars. And um, OK, they're going to hold it for you. And they say, thanks. Thanks. We're going to put that money to work, and we're going to give you your cut. And the way that they're going to give you your cut is they're going to mail you a check. And the, the check amount is uh, PRT. And you know, if, if they do it every, if they do it at the end of every period, and if, if it, and if a period is a month, that means that they send you a check every month. Okay, well that's not the way savings accounts really work. How do they really work? Right, that this 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 arrow that doesn't doesn't end up sending a check through the mail. What it does is that it loops back around into the account. Okay, so that so that it amounts to a deposit in your account. So this is called simple interest, but when you take this this arrow and you close the loop, what's it called? Compound interest. is closing the loop. <clears throat> okay, so now, now there's uh, <clears throat> five parameters in this model. So we have P, this is the principal. R, this is the uh, interest rate. <clears throat> N is the number of compoundings per period. T is the number of periods.
and A is the current account balance. Okay, so N and T, they, they, uh, they uh, <coughs> sort of need, need some explanation. So it, it depends on the length of a period. So in, in, in real life, uh, a period is usually one year. Uh, so, you, so you hear th terms like the annual interest rate. So, that's, that, so that means that interest is, is, is reckoned over the course of a year, but how many times is, is, is uh, interest compounded in the course of that year? Usually monthly. So, so in, in that case, what would N be? 12, right? So the number of compoundings per period. But in principle, we, we, we could reckon interest every week. And, and, and in that case, if the period was, was a year, what would N be? 52. Or, you know, you could, you could compound it, you know, wh ha however you want, right? So if a period is a year, we could compound it every fortnight. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's that? Two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. So that means there'd be 20, N, N would be 26. Okay. <clears throat> so the model that, that relates all of these is A is P multiplied by 1 plus R over N to exponent N T. So this is a formula that until the end of the semester and in your business classes if you if you end up taking business classes that you need to memorize. This is called the compound interest formula. So any questions about the formula? Okay, well, that's all that I plan to get to today. So we'll do, we'll do an example of one of these at the beginning of next time. So have a nice uh, Monday.